The creed sums up the whole work of Christ in one little phrase, the forgiveness of sins. I think there's great wisdom enshrined in the creed when it passes over all the other theological matters it could have taken up. It simply says the forgiveness of sins. That's why Jesus came. He died to set us free from sin. You don't have a religion that has as its center a crucifixion unless you have a humanity that is desperate. When the creed talks about the forgiveness of sins, it's reminding us, first of all, that there are sins that need to be forgiven. You have to understand what you are saved from in order to appreciate what it took to save you. If Christianity requires the death of the Son of God, then sin must be something radical and powerful. God's declaration to the world is that our primary problem lies in sin. That little word sin, three letters, carries so much weight. Sin's described in any number of ways in the Old Testament and, and indeed illustrated in any number of ways in the New. And because sin is so complex, I don't think any one word can capture it. It's not just a single or shallow concept, but a, a multivaried concept. Sin can be described uh, in strong terms as a rebellion. You defy God. It is described as disobedience. But it's also described as transgression, as straying. Sin can be described as slavery. Sin is likened, you know, to shooting the arrow, the bow and the arrow, and you shoot and you miss the bullseye, you miss the mark. It's also just being lost in God's world, alienated from him. Sin can also be described as uh, falling short. You, you don't quite make it to the finishing line, you fall short. You don't finish the job. Sin, then, is not a misdemeanor. Sin is not little individual acts that you're sorry for. Sin is a state of being that you cannot change because you are turned away and you are a rebel against God. You may not see yourself that way, but that is what Revelation declares that you are. So there may be uh, an act of deliberate, intentional rebellion against God, or it may be less intentional than that, but still lead us uh, to break relationships with God. So it's disobedience to his law and lostness 
uh, in his world. And sin ruins and sin destroys. And our greatest need is to have the sin which we uh, practice, the sin which lies within us dealt with. Sin is not only what we do, sinners is what we are. This little word sin carries so much pain and tragedy and weight. But having said that, the creed is then making the point that there is a remedy for sin. It's not a forgiveness of sins that we can do ourselves. It's not something that we can earn. It's not something we can appease God. It's not within human power. But Christ and grace is even greater than all that sin entails. So Christianity is based on the truth that the human condition is so radically enslaved into the power of sin that it took the Son of God on the cross in order to expiate that sin. God sees us as we are in Christ, that we are enfolded or shielded or protected by the righteousness which Christ won by his obedience on the cross. As far as forgiveness is concerned, it's a four-letter word, done. For you the purple current flowed in pardons from his wounded side, languished for you the eternal God. For you the Prince of Glory died. Believe and all your sins forgiven. Only believe and yours is heaven. The great work of Christ is to lead, as the Creed says, to the forgiveness of sin, the dealing with that, so that it is no longer held in our account, no longer is our name on the charge sheet, but we are set free from that. When I accepted Jesus Christ into my life as a young lad of 13, I knew what I was receiving, the forgiveness of my sin. What a sweet word that word forgiveness is. Forgiveness is liberating. Forgiveness sets us free to be ourselves. I am no longer guilty. Um, the, the, the crimes I have committed against God, for those I am pardoned, and the charges no longer lay uh, with my name on them. But it leads to a whole range of other things that arise because of sin. And so in the New Testament, to describe the work of Christ, you have a series of metaphors, images. Some have set up to 40 different insights within the New Testament alone. The New Testament talks about, for instance, redemption. Redemption is a word for what happened in a slave market when somebody who was a slave was set free and a price was paid to gain their freedom. They were then considered to be redeemed. And we have had the price of our sin paid for us and we are therefore liberated and set free. It talks about it as uh, a ransom being paid uh, just as if somebody is taken hostage, a ransom money may be paid in order to secure their freedom. So Jesus spoke about him coming into the world, not to be served, uh, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. If we think of, of uh, sin as lostness, Christ's work means he's found us like the shepherd who's gone out and taken the lost sheep into his bosom. We think of, of sin as separation, a fractured relationship. Christ's work means welcome home, come back to the family. You're adopted into the family. You belong here. Like the father who welcomes home the prodigal and says, kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party tonight because my son has come home. Come into the law courts and uh, there you get the idea of justification, the, the judge, hearing what's more like a civil case than our criminal case, uh, hearing a dispute between people, declares us to be in the right, and that's justification. Or, or come uh, into uh, the nursery and uh, there see new babies being born, new life coming into fruition. Forgiveness of sins leads to a new beginning and to new life, uh, come into the temple where sacrifices are offered 
and the language of purification is used and the way in which the defilements of the past and many of us in our lives feel defiled we're dirty because of the things we've thought and done uh, and the forgiveness of sins means that defilement is wiped away or come into the family where there may have been disputes and arguments and relationships may have been broken down uh, and there is the concept of reconciliation warring parties becoming friends and we and God who'd been on the opposite sides of a conflict now because of God's initiative and God's gift and God's self-giving overcomes that obstacle and we are reconciled to him all that and much more is wound up in this one concept of the forgiveness of sins forgiveness suggests that sin is is a debt a huge debt that we can never pay off and that then is like a this terrible burden around our neck this albatross but forgiveness is hey the debt is paid go free cut off that albatross stand on your feet like a man or a woman walk out into the sunlight you're my child go free my child be creative laugh sing dance be happy you're free the forgiveness is already there you know, the question is will we begin to respond to forgiveness and be restored Recent centuries, our uh, Christian faith has developed a number of very precious words that uh, a lot of people reject today because they sound complicated and old-fashioned. You have um, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Right, they're not so difficult uh, to understand as some people make out. Justification is the work of God through the Holy Spirit when a person responds to the grace of God in Christ, they are justified. That is, they are restored in their relationship with God in a way that enables them to begin to move toward wholeness in the image of Christ. Justification means that we are brought into a right standing with God, uh, the position of being vindicated and made just or declared just in a court of law. When God forgives you in Christ, it's a done deal. Again, you can fall from it, you can fail to take full advantage of it, but uh, the slate is wiped clean. So sin no longer dogs us uh, from a, a God's viewpoint, from a judicial viewpoint. We may still have to struggle with it down here uh, on earth, but, but actually uh, we are justified and we can be sure of that and certain of it. We don't have to be insecure in our relationship with God. Paul says, if Christ is in you, or by any, anybody's definition, that's a Christian. This is Romans 8.10. If Christ is in you, there are two conditions. He says, your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Your body is dead because of sin. And what's he talking about? He's talking about what Wesley called the remnants of sin in the believer. You know, before you come to faith in Christ, you're a unified person. From the center of your being to the outermost fringes, you're God. <laughs> you're playing the Lord of your life. And under your lordship, you put in place a whole structure, habits, attitudes, perspectives, ways of reacting, relating to others around you. You put in place a body of being. When you, when you come to faith in Christ, when you respond to the cruciform love of God, your spirit comes alive because of righteousness. You're on the track. What about all that other stuff? It's still there. 
the old habits, the old attitudes, the old perspectives, the old ways of reacting and relating to the world, they don't just disappear overnight. You begin a process of sanctification. You're on a journey. And Paul says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will make alive your dead body. You see, it's the work of the Spirit to take those attitudes, to take those habits, to take those relationships, to take those ways of responding and relating, to, reacting to others, and to make them Christ-like. Paul says, so we are no longer debtors to the flesh. We no longer need to live by that old structure of our being, our old false self. But he says, for if you continue to live according to the flesh, you're about to die. You go back into that spiritual death. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. There is the spiritual journey, you see, of moving forward. So, you know, Paul, an assurance of salvation is the assurance of, of your living by and walking by the Spirit. Paul talks about the assurance in the next couple of verses where he says, you know, we have not received the spirit of slavery again to fear. We have received the spirit of sonship and daughtership. When we cry, Abba, Father, it's a spirit bearing witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And that's the assurance, is the assurance that we have from the Holy Spirit within us. John the Beloved tells us, quoting, using the words of Jesus, that who believes on the Son has passed from death to life, already has passed from death to life. He who believes in the Son has life, present tense. We now have life. He tells us in his first letter that uh, now are we the sons of God already, and we do not know what we yet shall be. And the book of Hebrews, if we go back to that, it rings with assurance what he has done. Once for all, he paid the price. Once for all, he put aside sin. Once for all, we have the assurance of access to God. Only the high priests could go into the most holy place of the Old Testament, but by the blood of Jesus, we have entry into the very presence of God now. Christ and grace is even greater than all that sin entails. And therefore, what the Creed is saying in this simple phrase, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, is that there is something about the gospel that is able to meet the deepest human needs that is able to deal with the worst aspects of human nature and able to offer us a changed nature and a changed hope. And that is an immensely important thing to be able to say. That begins a journey of sanctification. That very justification that we experience, the atonement for our sin which is in place, then leads us on to sanctification, which is the progressive work of the Holy Spirit by which we are, from one degree to another, uh, made like Christ, changed into his image, uh, making progress in a clean and transformed life. And, and unlike justification, which is a, a definite act, sanctification is an ongoing process. Salvation is, is not an event, it is a relationship. It is the restoration of a relationship with God. Peter has an interesting phrase where he says that we may grow up into salvation. Like newborn babes, the desire of the pure spiritual milk, that you may grow up by it to salvation. Wait a minute, Peter, aren't we saved? When we accept Jesus, what's this growing up into salvation? Well, that's what I've been talking about here. It's a process. You see, when, when, we, when we respond to God's grace, when we respond to that cruciform love in Christ, we put our foot on a process, on a journey toward Christ's likeness, toward complete restoration in loving union with God. 
which is the goal of salvation. It's what salvation is all about. Does this mean that in this life we can achieve the full holiness that God wants? It is God's desire that we come to a point in this life where we do not yield to sin, where our hearts are so devoted in love to God that we turn away from anything that would mar that devotion. John Wesley, the early Methodist writer, talked about what he called entire sanctification. What it meant to Wesley was coming to that point on the journey where you loved God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, where you were 100% committed to the process of God's restoring you to wholeness in the image of Christ. Up to that point, you sort of waffle back and forth. You're justified, but in a sense, you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> you know, well, you want this right relationship with God, but you, well, put it this way, you want you want to be in relationship with God, and you want God to be God in your life, but you want God in your life on your, on your terms. Entire sanctification is coming to the point of allowing God to be God in your life on God's terms. Now, Wesley speaks of sanctification beyond entire sanctification, because what happens at the point of entire sanctification is when you begin to allow God to be God in your life on God's terms, then you begin, you sort of go into overdrive, you might say, you begin to move in that process toward Christ-likeness with much more regularity and intensity, you see, whereas before it was sort of an on-again, off-again kind of thing. Now, as Paul says, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. That's a statement of entire sanctification. But Paul begins it by saying, not that I'm already perfect, you see. He's on the way. Full sanctification, becoming truly holy, is something that we can only achieve in heaven. That we are limited by the fact that we are human. That being human places limitations upon us. Jesus told us, after all, to say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And presumably he didn't expect us only to have to say that once and never to need to say it again. That's part of the Lord's Prayer. We are expected to say it on a regular basis. But actually, within ancient Judaism, that fits the pattern perfectly well. If you wanted to be holy as a Jew, it didn't mean you must never ever get anything wrong. It means that whenever you do something wrong, you go to the temple, you offer your sacrifice, you make restitution, you say you're sorry, and you claim God's forgiveness. Now, within the Christian dispensation, whenever we sin, we are called to repent, to return to the Lord, to receive his forgiveness, and thus to be maintained as God's holy people, not God's people who never make any mistakes, but God's people who, like a compass needle, when we wobble away, we say, hey, no, that's no good, and we come back. And then, of course, the Christian account of that is that it's the Holy Spirit himself who enables us to do that. So that's what holiness kind of smells like in the present, against the day when the sinful body will finally drop away at death, and it's only when we are liberated from this human condition by being raised to glory that we can really hope to have this full holiness which God desires for each of us. Until the day when then we are given the resurrection body in the new creation. Of course, glorification is coming to fullness in the image of Christ. It is the restoration to complete Christ-likeness. We need a balance. Uh, on the one hand, we must recognize, yes, we are forgiven sinners, that we're like the publican in the parable, you know, not the Pharisee who boasted, but the publican who said, uh, God be merciful on me, a sinner. Yet at the same time, just a, a couple of chapters before, Jesus said, whoever does not forsake all he has cannot be my disciple. So the danger of playing on the being the publican and, you know, God be merciful unto me, a sinner, is that it can, I can say to myself, that's a nice one, just carry on the way I am and pray every night, God be merciful unto me, a sinner, and that's all right. But no, no. Whoever doesn't forsake all he has cannot be my disciple. So we need to hold those two in balance. Uh, yes, we're forgiven sinners. Yes, we're unworthy and so on. But that is not an excuse for saying, I'm just going to sit back and remain unworthy. Uh, we need to follow the path of discipleship. Otherwise, we have no right to claim to be forgiven sinners. The problem here is thinking of sin as actions, as deeds. And so, you know, if I, if, I, if I do some sin tomorrow, you see, can I be forgiven? Or am I already forgiven? That's, see, sin 
The deeds are simply the outer manifestation of an inward reality. It's not the deeds that are the problem. It's being the kind of person that acts that way that's the problem. And, and, and God's forgiveness, you see, is not designed so that God says, oh, well, I'll just, I'll just forget about that thing you did. And then you do it again. Oh, well, I'll forget about that thing you did. No, For the purpose of forgiveness is not to, to forget about the things we did, but to transform us so that we no longer do those things. First John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's what it's all about. See, if you look at forgiveness, it's, it's just sort of a forensic thing that, that God looks at your list of things and says, well, I'll just, I'll just throw that out. That's not, that's not what God's worried about. God's concerned about the nature of your being that results in that kind of action. And what God wants to do is to transform that being into one where those actions will not occur. And until the work of the transforming Holy Spirit is complete, until the day of Christ, when God's work within us will be finally finished, we will always bear the burden of those two things together. Uh, but maybe, hopefully making progress, hopefully the sin element, the giving in to temptation will lessen, the nearness to God and the sanctity of life will increase. Nowhere in the New Testament is there any suggestion that for any Christian there is a period of post-mortem purification to be gone through. There is no sense anywhere that most Christians have to go through a long period of gradually being cleaned up for this very good reason, which the 16th century reformers saw very clearly, that uh, death itself finishes off the process of the struggle for holiness which is going on in this life. And I think Paul means that death itself is that moment of struggle and awfulness and horror at the end of which, once somebody has died, if they are in Christ, there is nothing more about them that is sinful. That is hugely important for us to grasp today. In age and feebleness extreme, who shall a sinful worm redeem? Jesus, my only hope thou art, strength of my failing flesh and heart. Oh, could I catch a smile from thee and drop into eternity? Oh, could I catch a smile from thee and drop into eternity? Creed then moves on to its climax, and it talks about the great Christian hope for the future. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. The resurrection of the body. We believe that we are risen with Christ even now in this life, but that there is a resurrection of the body to come. It is our Christian faith that the dead will be raised up. The creed moves on to its final statement to talk about judgment, talk about resurrection, and talk about finally being with God in glory. That forgiveness of sins is not merely about uh, the here and now, uh, but it leads on to something. And right at the heart of the Christian hope is the resurrection of the body. And what the creed is saying here is that this life 
is not the end. This life is not the last word. There is a greater hope that is there for Christians, that is theirs if they put their faith in Christ. During his earthly ministry, Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus, and he said to those gathered around, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The truth of Jesus' claim is verified by his own resurrection from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have slept, the New Testament says. And the Creed is saying to us very simply that to put your faith in Christ is to be able to share in His resurrection. My practice is to bury someone in water uh, and to raise them up out of the water then. And that captures the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ in dramatic action. and. Uh, captures the symbolism of being united with Christ in his death and burial and resurrection, to which Paul refers in Romans chapter 6. And as we look back to Jesus' resurrection, so we look forward to the resurrection of the body, not the immortality of the soul. That's another idea not found in the scriptures. But the resurrection of the body, the body which has been made by God and destined for eternity, this body itself will be restored and resurrected at the last day. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we evermore be with the Lord. And then he adds this word of exhortation. Wherefore, comfort one another, strengthen, encourage one another with these words. It has its origins in, in a Jewish expectation that was associated with the restoration of the kingdom, which they were looking for as a historical event in an ongoing historical pattern, in which the, the righteous dead would be resurrected to participate in the restored kingdom. And it was a physical resurrection. They would, you know, if you were a, a righteous martyr um, who had died when the kingdom was restored, if I was somebody who just happened to be around when the kingdom was restored, you'd be back there living with me. So that, that's the initial understanding. But underneath that is a deeper reality, and that is that, that we are created as embodied beings. The Christian faith, unlike many other religions and isms, does not say when you die, that's it. Nor when you die, do you cease as an individual personality to exist, and so you're caught up in some great being in the universe, losing your individual identity. Most Christians think of the future hope as being that uh, when you die, you go to heaven to be with Jesus and remain with him forever, or something like that. It's not to go to heaven when you die. In fact, the New Testament doesn't say very much about going to heaven when you die. It says a lot about the resurrection of the body. That owes more to Gnosticism, uh, one of the early heresies that it does to the New Testament. The Christian hope in the New Testament was not when you go to you die, you go to heaven to be with Jesus. Christian faith is a very material faith in many ways. and speaks not even about the survival of the soul, which is about Greek philosophy or the immortality of the soul, as if we somehow in the next life will be disembodied spirits. We are not simply disembodied spirits. We are embodied beings. I am not just a soul living temporarily in a body. I am a unified whole of body and soul together. I am my body, my body is me just as I am my soul, and my soul is me, and they cannot be separated. They are two ways of describing the same thing. The ultimate hope of the Christian is not for a disembodied immortality. Christian hope was the return of Christ, the resurrection of the body. When Paul said, if Christ isn't risen from the dead, our hope is vain and so on, what he was saying is, if all we have to look forward to is a disembodied existence as some spirit in heaven, then our faith is a lot of rubbish. Without the resurrection of the body, our hope is vain, because the resurrection of the body is at the heart of Christian belief, uh, even though it has rather dropped out in much popular Christian thought. Um, 
I've been to more than one funeral where one hears something like this. Um, it is not our brother that is there in the coffin. What is in the coffin is just the outward shell and, and, and so on. That isn't, that isn't actually what the Christian faith is, 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 is about. The Christian faith is the hope of resurrection. Uh, a rather nice example was given me a, a, a few years ago by one of my students who said that he'd been to a funeral where the minister had said, um, what is in the coffer in there is just a shell. The nut has gone, <laughs> just uh, describing the departed as a nut. But um, that is not the Christian hope. The Christian hope is that uh, on the day of Christ, we will all who have died will rise again and there will be the resurrection of the body. That's the Christian hope rather than some nebulous sort of idea of survival after death. The scriptures do not teach immortality to the soul. That is a, a, an idea of Greek origin. Rather, they teach the Hebrew conception of resurrection of the body. So the creed affirms, I believe in resurrection of the body. Sometime out there ahead of us, there will be a resurrection where we will be restored in an, in an embodied existence in a renewed creation, a new heaven, a new earth, or a new sky, a new earth is probably the way it should be translated. It's talking about a new creation. In Revelation 21, in Romans 8, when God remakes and restores the whole cosmos in 1 Corinthians 15 when God abolishes death itself, an idea which most people have hardly begun to get their minds around in my experience, then we will be given new bodies to live in God's new world. It's something that is there for eternity and we can enter into it and share this complete transformation of our existence which the gospel promises. And so in the face of disease and deterioration, old age, death itself. This is the hope that the Christian believer has. I have a daughter who has severe rheumatoid arthritis and her body is riddled with it. Her poor hands are misshapen, her joints are stiff. And when I think of her, I like to think that one day she will have a resurrection body. And when my own body begins to give out on me a little and I don't hear or see or remember as I would like to, I think to myself, never mind, a resurrection body in the glory with Jesus Christ. That is what I believe. When Paul speaks of this resurrection, he speaks of a spiritual body. He says there is a physical body, there is a spiritual body. Now, what that spiritual body is all about, we just really don't know. We do not clearly understand what will be the relationship between our present physical body and our resurrection body. But we believe it will be in some genuine sense the same body, the same and yet different because for the righteous it will be a glorified body. Paul also tells us it will be Christ-like. <laughs> we will be conformed to the image of his perfection, his, his holiness. Jesus' own resurrection is, is the model, is the prototype. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 spells this out in wonderful detail. That just as Christ died and was buried, so now he's the first fruits, it says, of the resurrection. And uh, the physical body of Christ died, uh, a, a new, somehow metaphysical, but still physical body arose. Uh, it uh, was undoubtedly physical. It, the body of the resurrection body of Christ uh, could be touched and handled. He wasn't a spirit. Uh, he invites Thomas to put his fingers in the, the nail marks and to put his hand in the, the wound in Christ's side. He was a physical body that ate fish and, and bread. And yet it was a different body. It wasn't limited it, by that materialism in the same way in which our physicality so often limits us so Jesus could appear, could just appear in people's midst and wasn't barred by locked doors. There are mysteries around it uh, but Paul has this wonderful affirmation that just as with Christ so with us what was mortal will rise immortal, what was perishable will rise imperishable and we will then 
live in eternity in a new form of existence in perfect harmony with God as the heavens and the earth are recreated. My personality will be preserved. I will be me. In a body that will not get sick, that will not grow old, will not wear out. And uh, a better body, but it'll be my body. I will be Bill Johnson. And uh, you, my friend, will be you in the resurrection. So resurrection, in a sense, is the resurrection of the body is a way of speaking of the consummation of our creation. That, that we are created by God for this life of loving union with Him in an, in an embodied existence in a perfect creation. And that that is what God is going to restore at the end. And now we've come to the conclusion of our study of the Apostles' Creed. It's reminded us of what a great God we serve, a God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the God of creation, of redemption, and the God of consummation. And what a wonderful way to conclude the Apostles' Creed, to affirm that we believe in the life everlasting. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have life everlasting. The image of death is the embrace of the father, of the son, or of the daughter, the embrace of the child. I think there Romans 8 is the strongest thing, where he says, Nothing will separate us from the love of God, including death. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor anything else, height, depth, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that when Christ says on the cross, today you will be with me in heaven, what he is saying is that death cannot put up a barrier between you and God. That you have already been saved and that death means God has and is and always will embrace you. And that that embrace cannot be threatened, it cannot be shattered, it is an embrace of love that is forever. And so what the creed is saying is that there is judgment, there is resurrection, and finally there is being with God forever in heaven. In other words, that the final goal of our life as human beings is to be with God as our Creator and as our Redeemer. And that is seen as something which we should really long for passionately throughout every moment of our life. I believe with all my heart that this this life is not all there is to it. In fact, I have to say, if this life is all there is to it, that's the worst possible thing I can imagine. Life is pointless. It's futile. Why am I here when I'm going to die and that'll be the end of everything? Why have I, through the years, accumulated wisdom, as I have, as you have, experience, so that I can advise other people and so on? I've learned so much. And at the end of it, just snuffed out, all finished. No, 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 my expectation, my hope, my creed tells me I believe in the life everlasting. Eternal life or everlasting life doesn't just mean the life that we know stretched out forever. When the resurrection happens, that will be a rushing together of new matter, of God doing a great act of new creation to make us as new people, to live in and share and help look after God's new world. That is the hope which is set before us. And that's actually what's meant by the life everlasting, which is the last phrase in the creed, because people often think life everlasting, that must be uh, disembodied, it must be that time has disappeared and that space has disappeared. I don't think so. God made a good world and it was a world of space and time and that will be redeemed 
space and time will no more have anything to do with us decaying and dying and being corrupted. It'll be a new kind of space and time, but it'll be God's new world going on into new things of which at the moment we can only just glimpse the edges. It's about something that is completely new. It's about a new level of existence. It's about being raised to a new way of living. That means we are ushered into God's presence to be with Him, not simply forever, but also in a new way of existence. It's a qualitative and quantitative difference which really brings about a complete transformation in our existence. Life everlasting, first of all, is eternal. Eternity does not have within it temporality. So eternity means that we are in a different realm of being. We are now in the presence of God. So life everlasting isn't about length of life. The primary issue is not duration. See, we, we tend to think of eternal life or everlasting life as a matter of duration. It's a matter of relationship. It's about the fact that death is defeated and I am now everlastingly in eternity in the presence of God. And that God, this is the God that has saved me, this is the God that loves me. And that I cannot be separated from that presence of God. John 17, 3, Jesus says, this is eternal life or this is everlasting life. To know thee, the only true God, and Jesus the Messiah whom you have sent. And what Jesus is saying there is that eternal life is relationship. It is knowing God. And what does, what does the Hebrew mind mean by knowing? It means that loving union. Paul says these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. Well, in heaven we won't need faith because we'll have sight. We will not need hope anymore, for we will have the very thing for which we have hoped. But even in heaven, we will still have and we will still need love. Love is the one thing we can experience here in this life that will last forever into life eternal. So eternal life is loving union with God in Christ. And I believe that that better life, life everlasting, already can begin now in Jesus Christ. That if I accept Jesus already, I have that eternal quality of life. My life may end, but with the resurrection, when Jesus returns, that quality of endless life will become actual endless life forever and ever in His presence. For that, we need to be ultimately forgiven of all our sins, and that happens wholly through the death of Jesus on the cross, but then applied to us through faith and then worked out through a life of holiness until finally it is sealed in the resurrection. So you can say all of that however you like, but it's one totality. God saying, yes, you are a sinner, and because of Christ, you are forgiven. And we are called not only to share that, but to become its agents, to be people through whom God can help bring that about. That's what resurrection of the body and the life everlasting is really all about. How happy started with, I believe in God, the maker. And we were there in Genesis chapter 1. We come to the end of the life everlasting. We're in the book of Revelation chapter 22. The wonderful thing is that in the whole thing, Genesis meets with Revelation. 
You start with the Garden of Eden, you end with a garden city where everything is perfected again. So that Genesis and Moses are shaking hands with the book of Revelation and John and the whole thing is one perfectible whole as the end meets the beginning. The Apostles' Creed is not a set of abstract statements or cold propositions of theology. I hope you've picked up the passion that lies behind these statements to declare that we believe in God, that Jesus Christ died under Pontius Pilate and now is exalted to the right hand of the Father on high, to declare that we believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Catholic Church it makes a fundamental difference in life. They're not words that we simply mouth, but the clue to transforming experience and to entering into the fullness of God's gifts for us and the forgiveness of sins and the transformation of personal character into Christ likeness. It's the secret to restoring the health, the broken health of our universe, uh, uh, of our world, uh, and uh, becoming the people that God intended us to be. So actually we have to make personal choices here. We don't just stand and say these words in a liturgy. Uh, if we do, they're vain and, and useless and worse than that because they're promises us something that we're not entering into. We need to make them statements of passionate personal conviction that I believe in God the Father and that he is my Father and I believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Saviour of the world, that he died under Pontius Pilate, yes, but for me. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me and that all these things uh, are part of the global plan of God for creation but wonderfully at the same time part of God's personal plan of grace for me. So the question naturally comes as to whether you might say these words merely as a statement of abstract theology or whether they are for you living statements of faith of personal conviction because you have committed your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in the way in which this creed invites us to do. And as we've begun to understand something of the meaning of the word saints, well we'd be reminded that you don't have to be anything special. You don't have to be good. You can come with all your sin and all your failure and still be accepted because what it means is that you can be forgiven today. You can cross over and become a saint yourself today if you respond to that amazing gift of love that God has given us in his son, Jesus Christ. Inspired of God, John, for unsold.